Hello, Montgomery College, Germantown. It is a thrill to be here because I actually attended Montgomery College Rockville back in the 80s. And let me tell you, we did not have any beautiful globe hall back then. So this is really a thrill to be back among my fellow students as an alum. So um, I'm just curious, how many people have some idea what the Equal Rights Amendment is? Raise your hand. Wow, terrific. OK, and then and I'm wondering how many people picked up the butterfly handout that was a few people. OK, terrific. All right, we'll get to that. OK, so this is exciting that you actually know, because sometimes when I come in and give talks, no one knows what the Equal Rights Amendment is. And so we kind of start from, from even further back. So basically, the reason why I'm here tonight is because I believe that there is a structural flaw in our Constitution that needs to be fixed. When people look at cultures and societies, it is up to us to look at whether or not our society is impeding or promoting human rights. And if it's not promoting human rights, then according to the Declaration of Independence, we can overthrow our government and start a new one. Anybody with me on that? All right. That might be a little difficult for us to do in this room. So instead of that, why don't we try to put women in the Constitution? Now, if any of you have done American history courses ad nauseum, you were probably told that in 1776, all men were created equal, and that actually meant women too. How many people were told that? And in fact, it's amazing how many people today actually believe that, that women were in the Constitution, when in fact, we weren't. We weren't, slaves weren't, and Native Americans weren't. So if we're looking at how to fix the structural defect in our society so that we can lift all of ourselves up, we need to take a look at something called tradition. Because laws are one thing, but our system of government is actually based on common law and tradition. These are beliefs and behaviors and thoughts that are passed down from generation to generation to generation. Why would we question tradition? I mean, tradition makes us feel safe. It gives us consistency. It gives us a grounding. And yet, at times, there comes a point in our lives where maybe we don't agree with what we've been told. And we think that there's maybe a different path that we want to carve. And so we, in fact, break with tradition. So the Capitol, how many people have actually been down to the Capitol to ever advocate on an issue? Raise your hand. Very few. It's interesting to me because since I began working on the ERA five years ago, I had no idea how few people are truly engaged in our democracy or our republic until um, I had a bill in Congress and I started meeting people and I said, well, hey, you know, you can call your legislator, you can get them on the line, you can tell them you want this bill. And they were like, yeah, yeah, okay. And they never did. And so I thought, why, why is it that people are so afraid of our government? Our government who we have given our consent to govern us. And yet, we remain very apathetic. We stand back. We back away from the issues. Is anybody else disturbed with what's going on in our country and around the world that we see on the news? And sometimes we don't even see it on the news. I'm often amazed that when I, when I look at Facebook, the stories that I'm seeing on Facebook are not what we hear on the mainstream media. In fact, it's much, it's much more real. Um, it troubles me very much that our media does not cover things that are important, such as the Equal Rights Amendment, such as the fact that bills were introduced about the Equal Rights Amendment, to put women and girls in our Constitution the first time in 224 years. And no major media station has covered this. Does that surprise you? 
disturbs me greatly. So when we talk about women's rights, how many women are with me? The Committee on Women's Rights will now come to order. Does it annoy you to no end to sit and watch television shows where men are talking about women's issues and how we feel about such and such? It drives, thank you. I'm like, excuse me, hello, are we invisible? I mean, it's ridiculous. But this tradition has existed since the beginning of time in America where we women were taught to be quiet that we were to maintain and be the masters of the domestic sphere instead of the public sphere. And so today, I still feel like, to a certain extent, we're back there because our voices aren't being heard. Our stories aren't being told. The horrors that are happening to women today are not being discussed. And what's even more disturbing than that to me is how often people ask me, why do women need equal rights? And I say, well, let's see, one in three women in the military are being raped. Women in the military have been fighting in wars, in combat, and yet officially they're denied combat positions. And so therefore, they're not given the pay and the promotional potential and the respect that our servicemen are given. Now recently, what's very exciting is that the ban, the recommendation from Secretary Panetta, or former Secretary Panetta, to lift the ban on the combat exclusion for women, this is fantastic news. Finally, women are gonna be acknowledged for the service they've been doing for years. But guess what? They're gonna be fighting and dying for a constitution that doesn't protect and defend our rights as human beings. That really bothers me. If you look historically, Abe Lincoln in the Civil War looked at that opportunity with our values of independence and freedom for the individual to abolish slavery and to give slaves the dignity of citizenship for their service and sacrifice for our country. There's been little to no mention of this historical lifting of the ban on combat exclusion for women. So I guess it probably shouldn't surprise us that we don't talk about the Equal Rights Amendment either. It's just kind of one of those things that we want to hide behind the curtain, one of those dark secrets in our history that we don't really want to talk about but we need to talk about it. Because as free as the US is, we are only as good as the freedom that all of our people have. It's particularly exciting to be here this week with the Supreme Court decisions that were coming down that had to do with same-sex marriage because human rights of any kind impacts and benefits us all, whether it's women's rights, whether it's environmental rights, race rights, gender, ability, you name it, it all benefits us. But what we need to realize as a society is that we cannot do it alone. That collectively, if society recognized our inherent strength and we united for equality, we would have it. But so far, I'm not seeing much union of people. I hear a lot of complaining, a lot of cynicism. People feel very checked out, not sure what's happening with our government, what's going to happen in the future. But I'll tell you, things aren't going to change unless we get engaged and we get into the game. That is really the only way that we are going to see women in committees, more in our government than 20% in the Senate. Woohoo! 20%, great, in the 21st century. Women are half the workforce, and we're 20% of the Senate. It's no wonder that the decisions that are being made that influence and affect people in their daily lives are made with such ignorance and such a lack of perspective because the very people whose lives they touch, the caregivers in society, women, aren't there at the table making those decisions. So breaking with tradition. So the 
Idea that I had with the handout of the butterfly is to help all of us sort of get inside ourselves for this feeling of what the ERA, what this opportunity is for us. Because while it feels like it's way out there, it's an abstract, what's the Constitution, what does this have to do with my life? It's very close to, whoops, sorry. It's very close to most of our hearts, is my guess. Breaking with tradition, an example that a friend of mine gave in 1967, she went to a school where girls couldn't wear pants. <laughs> and she was like, what? We can't wear pants? And so the girls got together and they said, you know what? We're done with the skirts and the bloomers. And they put on pants and they marched into school. They all got in trouble and all got sent home. But do you know that when the parents heard that the principal had sent their students home for wearing pants, they raised a ruckus. And that school changed its policy. And from that day forward, women were allowed to wear pants. So that's what breaking with tradition is. It's looking at what is our reality and does this make sense for us? Does it make sense for us that women are not in our Constitution? That they do not have the same level of equality and recognition in our laws as men do? I use an example with students sometimes. Do you remember what was happening in Arizona where they were rounding up the immigrants to send them back home? Well, the reality is that race, religion, and national origin are protected classifications in our Constitution. They have the highest standard of strict scrutiny, meaning that laws that are passed that in some way would negatively impact someone based on their race, religion, or national origin would be automatically struck down. The same does not hold true for sex. If a law discriminates on the basis of sex, as laws have for over two centuries in the US. They are an intermediate level of scrutiny. It means you have kind of a 50-50 chance of whether or not that court will rule in your favor, ladies and gentlemen. In fact, surprisingly, in 2007, the number one reason why sex discrimination cases came in front of the court was family discrimination leave fathers wanting to take off leave, and they were being denied because the role of men is supposed to be the provider of the family, and you're not supposed to have a heart, and you're not supposed to really need to want to be with your children growing up. So that's the beauty about the Equal Rights Amendment that many people don't realize, is that as much as it is going to benefit women to finally be in our Constitution, what it does is it takes every single law that we have across all 50 states in the federal government and policies and programs, and it changes a word male or female to person. Isn't that wonderful? Can you imagine to have all of the benefits and opportunities that are existing today be expanded to both sexes equally as human beings? It has a lot of promise. So, does anybody have an experience that comes to mind when they think about breaking with tradition? How many people have perhaps been the first person to go to college or change the policy at school to wear pants? Um, is there, are there people in here that have the sense of what it felt like to make a brave decision that perhaps was not one that had been made in your family or among your friends, your circle, and you made a different decision? And what did it feel like before you made that decision? And then once you did, what did you feel like afterwards? And then did it have any impact on your life? Anybody have this example? Anybody have an experience of breaking with tradition and doing something? Very few, wow, okay. Does it make sense, the breaking with tradition? Yes, maybe, no, okay. The butterfly effect, which I compare the Equal Rights Amendment to, 
is a scientific theory based on the effect of butterfly wings to create tiny atmospheric changes that can prevent, accelerate, or delay a tornado in another part of the world. And if you look at this metaphorically, there are seemingly insignificant moments in each of our lives where we may make a decision that at the time doesn't seem like a very big deal, and yet it has a profound impact on shaping our destiny and the course of history. Rosa Parks is one such person. Sitting in that bus, she changed a course of history. She was tired, she was in the section for blacks, and she said, I'm not getting up. She broke with tradition, and a bad tradition. We had a very interesting uh, tradition in my family where we would eat fruit salad for Thanksgiving. And this fruit salad had this real, my mother's cracking up in the front row, this fruit salad had this really awful tasting orange in it. And for years and years and years, we never said anything to her because we didn't want to hurt her feelings. And so one, one year, she forgot to add the oranges to the fruit salad. And she's like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I forgot the oranges in the Thanksgiving fruit salad. And we're like, you know what, mom? We never liked the fruit salad. This is fabulous without the fruit salad. And she was like, really? How come you never told me? And we said, well, it was tradition. We didn't want to break tradition, even though we didn't like it. And so from then on, we never had to eat those awful oranges in fruit salad again. And so it's a really small example, but it made Thanksgiving better because we could finally get it out on the table. And our only regret was that we hadn't said something sooner <laughs> so that we wouldn't have had to eat those lousy oranges. So women's equality has never been a spectator sport. It hasn't been since the founding of our country, and it certainly isn't now. So while fortunately for us, men can be on the sidelines and have full rights and full opportunities and not have his reproductive decisions challenged at every turn, not have to worry about not being paid equally, doesn't have to worry as much about being a victim of domestic violence or a victim of sexual assault. These are some of the symptoms of sex discrimination and the tradition that has been carried forth in our country because no one said, this doesn't taste right. This doesn't feel right. I want to make a change to this. So we need to get off the sidelines, as Senator Gillibrand says, or as Sheryl Sandberg says, to lean in. Because at some point in time, we are called upon in this country to not only impact and improve our lives and the situation that we're, we have at hand today, but also the lives of those coming after us and the lives around the world. When I first started working on the ERA, I only thought about this as far as women's equality in this country. And my mother had been divorced in her mid-40s, and so I, as a kid, knew that the law could be pretty bad to mothers and children. We had a really nice life before my dad left, and then we didn't have such a nice life after he left. And it was really interesting, because I would joke about to my friends that I felt like Cinderella when I would go out and visit my dad because I had all the wonderful things that we had when dad was still at home. But then when I came back home after a couple of weeks, it was like back to reality. I was like Cinderella's evil stepsister. And so that early awareness for me was a situation that I never thought I'd be in, and it certainly didn't directly impact me, but it did as a kid. And so I remember my mom saying to me, because she was always struggling financially. She had been a housewife and a mom for 20 odd, 25 years. And so she had not been in the workforce. She had no idea how she was gonna go back to nursing in her field. What if she hurt someone? What if she killed someone? But the courts didn't care. They gave her no credit for all the work that she had done to support my dad and to raise a family all those years. No credit. 
Does anybody have any idea what the value of a caregiver is in society today with all of the different duties that they do? Someone's shaking their head, do you know? How much? Okay, well that might be a babysitter, but when you take into account, okay, but when you take into account what a housewife or a mom value is in terms of our economy, it's $150,000. It's pretty amazing. Think of all the women that have done this job all these years and all the money that they never had for doing it. Do you think that's fair? I can't even imagine going through my whole life. By the way, I'm a spinster. Never married, no kids. And proud, happy. I know I'm an oddball when I turn on the TV that I'm happy and single, but I am. But I can't imagine what it would have been like to be working full-time, 24-7, and never earn a dime. And then, unfortunately, your mate decides they want to go for a younger model, and they leave, and then you're at the mercy of court. And you don't have that, that partner anymore that wants to be with you. And so that's when you really see the, the concern and why women are facing poverty why the largest group and the fastest growing group is women, elderly women and single mothers. So these are the kinds of things, the attitudes that need to change, but we have to start somewhere. If we don't create some kind of a standard of treatment, a benchmark, then there isn't any impetus to change. When we declared our independence, we put it in writing. Contracts are enforceable in writing. Verbal contracts are promises. They really don't mean a darn. When the terms of the agreement aren't met, that's kind of the way women's rights are in this country. They're sort of precarious because we don't have a guarantee from our government that says we're human beings. So we need to get off the sidelines, stop being spectators, and learn a little bit of our history. So, anybody know who this picture is of this lovely woman? In this picture, anybody? Yell out. Abigail. Yes, thank you. Abigail Adams, in 1776, March, in fact, March 31st, two, three days from now, she wrote a letter to John. And she said, hey, you are working on this new form of government since we declared our independence. How about not forgetting the ladies this time? We've been living under oppressed standards in a society under common law for long enough. You're declaring your independence from the divine right of kings? Declare our independence from the divine right of men. Didn't happen. He laughed at her, and he said, oh, Abigail, come on. This isn't really any, we can't throw off our masculine systems. It's just theory. You're the masters anyway. So unfortunately, that was one of those moments, one of those butterfly moments, not so positive, when women were again forgotten. But what was so serious about this was that here we were creating a brand new government for, by, and of the people, and we had no say in it. African Americans had no say in it. Native Americans just became prisoners. And so we are still bound by a constitution in this country that didn't include us from the beginning. We didn't agree to this, ladies. Why are we accepting it? Why are we condoning it? Why are we allowing the kinds of things that are happening to women in our society, to our sisters, our moms, our daughters, our granddaughters? Why are we allowing this? Why aren't we more upset? I got to tell you, every time I go to hear our officials that are supposedly in charge of women's rights, 
Department of Labor, State Department, the Global Women's Issues, the Wilson Center. It's all over there. It's like they're telling us all the problems of women are over there. They're not over there. They're here. They're right here in our backyard. And I asked them, how come you're not as committed to women in this country? When do we get to hear about our problems and what you're doing about them? And they never have an answer. So my only guess is that they're not asked this enough by women. Why aren't you doing something? Why aren't you protecting our general welfare here? I don't know. I think it's because we're just hanging back. We're not as brave as Abigail was back in 1776 to say, come on, John, let's create a new day. Now, one thing that's interesting that Nancy cracked up when I first did my talk was, it, through my research of women's history, I discovered some, ooh, oh boy, I'm breaking microphones. Um, wherever that went, I'll pick it up after, oh, let me get it. Okay, so what I discovered is that every 72 years, something really cool happens for women. How come? I don't know. I mean, 72, I looked it up. The rule of 72 has to do with interest rates, and you can figure out how many years you would earn a certain percentage of interest. And I thought, well, I don't think that's it. But interestingly, we'll walk through how I discovered this. So 1776 and 72 is what? Any math minds? 1848. What happened in 1848? Yes. Okay, so we had, there's my 72. Seneca Falls, Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. So here it is 72 years after the Declaration of Independence, and in fact, eight years prior to 1848, 1840, Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton meet in London at the World's Anti-Slavery Convention. And they get banished to the balcony. They get segregated. <laughs> They're sitting here trying to integrate and free slaves, and the women, I'm seeing someone shaking her head, and I, I mean, it just, it's, it's poetic. And so, they're, you know, it's, we're banished to the balcony, and at that point, that butterfly moment, they said, you know what? We need to be doing this for ourselves. What are we doing here? We don't have any rights either. And so they planned to do a convention that didn't happen. Am I messing things up? hopefully not, um, for eight years in 1848. And what was really neat about 1848 was that 300 people came versus 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence that were all white males and landowning. So not even all white males, just rich white males. The same folks that are running our country today. Things haven't changed much in two centuries. But anyway, what'd you say? 1%, exactly. But so they had 300 people in attendance, 100 people signed. Do we know what it's called? The Declaration of Sentiments. Did anybody know that there was actually a response to our Declaration of Independence in 1848 that said all men and women are created equal? And it was signed by twice as many people as who signed the Declaration of Independence. It had an African-American man, and it had women and other men. 68 women, 32 men. A bit more diversity than what happened 72 years earlier. But it was so radical that women and men would be equal, that they settled for, OK, the first right of citizenship would be the vote. So from that day forward, it was the first organized movement. So Abigail wasn't just out here. There were actually women that were coming together to earn a right to vote. Is it because I've taken this off that it's creating, like, static? Maybe that's better. Okay. So they um, got together. They had this convention. And do we know how long it was before the 19th Amendment was finally ratified? Right. How many years is that? 72 years. Kind of bizarre. Now, interestingly, as Nancy said, Justice Scalia said, women are not, sex discrimination has not been outlawed in the Constitution. 
Do you know that Susan B. Anthony told us that back in like 1871? when she decided to vote to see if the 14th Amendment of equal protection and due process that was intended for race, and actually not all members of race, African American males, she decided to go vote to see if she was equally protected under the laws. Anybody know what happened? She got arrested. She was such a strategist though, because what she did is she proved that the 14th Amendment didn't apply to women. And the problem with us not knowing our history is that we didn't know that she already told us that long time ago that the 14th Amendment. You'd be amazed how many people tell me, Carolyn, you don't need the Equal Rights Amendment because you have the 14th Amendment. I'm like, really? No, go back and learn your history because Susan B. proved we didn't. But what was really great about Susan was she said, you know what? I'm not going to pay that $100 fine. You can go ahead and arrest me. And he took her down to jail. And she never did pay that $100 fine. And so she was one of those Rosa Park types that broke with tradition, and the men did not know what to do arresting a woman for voting. They really, they, they what could they, you know, okay. So, 72 years later, 1920. Woohoo, do you like my interstate 72 sign? Okay, so 1920. We're out here marching. Now, you can't see the upper right, and I'm really sorry for this, but what was really amazing to me is that there are dates talking about how women voted in 1778, and then another woman voted in 1809. And I'm like, wow. These, so the states were voting first before the federal, but to imagine that women were working on voting that far back was just amazing to me, and, and to see these signs of the women marching. And so, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? So they participated in parades, and they did protests in front of the White House. And in fact, the suffragists, which is the American suffrage movement, learned their silent, nonviolent protests from the suffragettes in the UK. And that was actually the start of our silent, nonviolent protests that Gandhi and the Civil Rights Movement and the Women's Rights Movement all adopted later. But this is a piece of history that, again, many people don't know because women's history is usually confined to a tiny little box off to the side in a textbook. And so we don't get, <laughs> we don't get to learn those really interesting things that make us, whoops, feel proud of being women. But I, I particularly liked the corner of men, the headquarters opposed to women voting. And the reason why I included this slide is to say that these men were probably afraid that the sky would fall if their wives voted. And they thought awful things about it. And the sky didn't fall and their wives got to vote, and they probably had some impact, at least on the representatives that began to represent them in our government after 1920. But I show you that because change is tough, and when you are in the driver's seat, it's tough to think about letting someone in on the passenger seat. But guys, I wanna ask you, when you ask women, or you go on and blog and you say you don't need your rights, you have special protections, how would you feel if you were a second-class citizen today? And what is the big fear, the big worry for women to have equality? Lose power, absolutely. But couldn't we share power? I don't know about you, but I walk down the street and I see moms, women, and they look really miserable. How many people look at women walking down the street that never smile, they're angry, they're rude drivers, and you just sit here going, what is her problem? But then, <laughs> I do that all the time, and then I go, oh, gee, but I don't have kids, and I don't have a husband, so what am I complaining about? But <laughs> she's exhausted. She's exhausted because women, in large measure, entered our workforce in the 1970s, with no policy change with the way we do business. And they're exhausted. There's not affordable health care. There's not affordable, well, there's soon to be maybe affordable health care. 
But there's no affordable childcare. There's no national flexible work schedule for men and women, whether they're parents or they're singles and they're going back to school or they're volunteering in their communities or they're taking care of their parents. We don't have that kind of flexibility here. Yet we, our country has changed. We have two people in the workforce. We have kids going wild and going crazy because they don't have any supervision at home. But what's the answer? Some people would say, we'll put women back in the home. Heck no, Joe. But why don't we get together collectively and say, you know, maybe the problem is, is that our government is still treating our society like women are back in the home when they're not. And if we can get women to get their equality, then the policies and the commitment of our government to change our lives, our quality of life, for the better, begins. That's why I got involved in this. I came from corporate America. I was laid off from a job I loved, but my job was work-life initiatives. I helped employees be more effective on the job so that our company could be more profitable. It was an awesome job. I worked, I counseled and coached management on how they could use these different programs and benefits to engage their employees and enable them to balance their work and home life. And then on the flip side, I would talk to employees and I'd hear what mom's challenges, dad's challenges, single people's challenges, you name it. And so we would help them figure out a way that they could balance all the important things in their lives so that they could be present at work. But what I realized is that our company, Discovery Channel, was a fabulous company. It won all kinds of awards, but guess what? The benefits never extend to our workplaces across this country. It was just confined to our four walls. And so when I was laid off from this awesome job, I said, you know what? Maybe it's public policy that needs to change. Maybe what I need to do is go into government and take what I know about corporate America and what it's trying to do to create a more equitable workplace for women and bring it to our government. But you know what? Government ain't listening because they don't have to because we're still second-class citizens. And when you're a second-class citizen, you don't get to petition for your rights the way a full citizen does. So they don't listen to us. So corporations are doing things independently on their own, but it doesn't branch out to all of us. And I see some people that are probably in careers now and some people that haven't maybe gotten their full-time job yet and maybe some of us are unemployed. But when you get out there and you see the reality of how hard you're gonna be working because there's less jobs and there's less people doing those jobs, the work-life balance piece and the quality of life and your health and your stress level is gonna be really important to you. And so it's something to think about that in changing and transforming our society into the 21st century, the piece that we have not brought forward in our country is the fact that women are equal citizens. If you look historically, protections for women benefited men. It was a bonus. This isn't gonna be any different. But we have to work together to do something about it. So, 72 years, from 1920 is, okay, we're not gonna get there yet because right after 1920, we got the vote, Woohoo! There was this wonderful woman named Dr. Alice Paul. She had a double doctorate in civil law and economics. This was unheard of for a woman to have not one but two doctoral degrees. This was at a time when most guys didn't finish high school. So that gives you the context of this. So Alice Paul was one of those raging, radical, militant suffragists that was arrested, tortured, beaten. She went on a hunger strike. She was force fed so that she wouldn't die in prison because they didn't want the papers to know that the suffragists were dying in prison. That's what we did to women who wanted a right to vote in this country. So that's what I mean, and that's what I meant by that slide, that you can't be a spectator in this. You can't be. Now, thank God, I think, things have gotten better today than they were then. But those women created lives for us today that we can't take for granted. Women are like the number one consumers of self-help books. And I always laugh because I think, well, self-help books tell you to set a goal. 
figure out the steps to the goal, and when you reach that goal, what do you do? Crap out? Enjoy your, your winnings? No, you set another goal, and another goal, and another goal. Well, that is the journey to women's equality. We didn't get it with suffrage. We're not there yet. So we have to keep working at this. And so Alice Paul said, you know what? I know that the way that we can level the playing field and we can bring one set of rules for our society instead of two sets, one for full citizens and one for second class citizens, with an Equal Rights Amendment. So she drafted the original Equal Rights Amendment, which I think the language was really beautiful. And in fact, I prefer this over the language that we have today. Men and women shall have equal rights throughout the United States and every place subject to its jurisdiction. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Didn't go anywhere for like 50 years. It was introduced in every Congress. Congress, meh, kicked it off to the side. Probably because people weren't calling their Congress people. They were ignoring that capital down there, disengaged. Government is lousy, why should I care? And they just could ignore the bills, and that was it. And so Alice, after 20 years, 1943, she ended up rewriting the Equal Rights Amendment to this. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. This became our version today. 1943 and 72, 2015, that's our campaign. She decided to do equality of rights under the law because this way it would more, it would be, uh, excuse me, it would closely resemble the 14th Amendment. And amazingly, the ERA is the 14th Amendment for women. And if we were to get it in this campaign by 2015, it would be the 28th Amendment. 14 times 2 is 28. Kind of neat. So anyways, 1972, it's not 72 years, but it's 1972, huge year, 50 years go by, and finally Congress ratifies the ERA. Woohoo! Huge majorities, 384 in the House, and I think it was like 82 in the Senate. So it was a huge, huge victory for women. But the problem was they attached a little hitch to it, a little seven-year deadline, knowing full well that it took how many years for suffrage? 1848 to 1920, 72 years? Good luck, ladies, getting all the other rights that you are entitled to in seven years. Now, interestingly, the women took that and said, fabulous, we're going with it. We'll take the deadline. We know we can do this. How in the world could our country in the 1970s deny women equality? I mean, come on, we had Wonder Woman, we had Bionic Woman, we had Charlie's Angels. You know, one day at a time, Alice, all these wonderful, strong role models. I mean, we were just singing. And unfortunately, or fortunately, the strategist Dr. Alice Paul, who was still alive until 1977, she worked every day of her life to try to get the ERA passed. Her two-word response when everybody was out celebrating in the street was, we lost. She knew that women had lost. She had managed to keep that deadline off the ERA for 50 years. But the young folks shoved her aside. We had women's organizations, fledgling ones, coming together, and they pushed her aside, and they said, no, we think we can do this in seven years. Well, we didn't do it in seven years, but we did really well. We got one state within hours, Hawaii. We had seven states in the first week. 22 states in the first six months, and 30 in the first year, which was awesome. So we were really cranking. Do you know how many states we needed after our two-thirds majority in Congress? Three-fourths or 38. So we got 35, and we asked for an extension of seven more years. You're shaking your head. <laughs> Why are you shaking your head? Talking, eating, okay, boring lecture, fair enough. Okay, so we asked for seven more years. We got three, no more states. June 30th, 1982, the ERA died, expired. It was really, really awful because women 
had worked so hard and like look at these beautiful pictures of these young kids probably at Montgomery College, you know, marching in the streets. We had Betty Ford, the most outspoken first lady Republican for the ERA, which by the way, if anybody doesn't think that Republicans are for or were for women's rights, you're really wrong because all of the suffrage and abolition and temperance was all led by Republicans at that time. And she was, to date, the most outspoken first lady for equal rights for women at a time when it was harder to talk about equal rights for women than it would be in 2015, or 20, what are we, 2013. And so then I love this, all people are created equal, because that really is what we're saying with the ERA. And then does anybody know who this lovely woman is? Yeah, Shirley Chisholm. So hey, you know what? She was the first African American to run for president. But who knew? I wonder if it had to do with her gender. Didn't count, maybe. I don't know. But she was really cool, and if you ever get a chance to go online to YouTube, Shirley Chisholm does a fabulous speech on the Equal Rights Amendment and how she, as a black woman, experienced more discrimination being a woman than she did for her race, and this was in 1969. So at the end of the day, I said we had 35 states out of the 38 we needed. So this is what the map looks like today. All the dark purple states are the ones that have it. They get it. They said, yeah, women equality, OK, makes sense to us. Probably not so surprising that our southern states, right? I mean, they wanted slavery to last forever. And, um, and we know that you were not free if you lived in the south, and you were freer if you lived in the north. Well, it's pretty much the same way with women today. Although Virginia is quite scary, not too south of us, but certainly close enough that we could have some impact. So we only need three states left to put women and girls in the Constitution, something that we haven't been able to do for two centuries. Pretty amazing. Okay, so this, this is, kind of looks like me, but it's not. But this is how the women were feeling when Congress said, time's up, June 30th, 1982, go back home and start all over. They're like ripping out their hair, what? Okay, so they're totally beside themselves. They work so hard. 450 organizations were involved in this over a 10-year period to end in defeat by an arbitrary deadline of seven years that was extended three more years to 10 years. So what happened? Fear. What do we do? We still have all these problems that made us come out for the ERA, and they're not going to go away. So what do we do? Confusion, doubt, hope, wonder. Thank God for these people that didn't give up on the ERA, ladies and gentlemen. They said, I am not a second-class citizen. Whether my Congress says it or not, whether it's going to tell me that the time has run out and I have to start all over again, uh-uh. I'm not a second-class citizen. And so with that thought in mind that I'm not a second-class citizen, 72 years, now this was 1920 to the 72, now here it is, is 1992. In 1992, two cool things happened. Anybody know? The most women that ever ran for Congress. Have we heard that before? <laughs> well, it happened back in 1992. I think it was like five. But what also happened in 1992, which was really, really cool, was the 27th Amendment, which should have been the ERA, but it wasn't, was ratified. The Madison Amendment. This had to do with congressional pay raises. And what it said is that Congress could not award itself a pay raise in one session of Congress and be able to take advantage of it. They had to wait and get reelected before they could take their pay raise. Funny how that just disappeared for like two centuries. It was one of these lost amendments that was found by a student doing a research paper on the deadline on the ERA. And he discovered the Madison Amendment and said, wow. And this young man led a like one man campaign for the Madison Amendment and got it passed in the legislatures that he needed. He did not go back to the beginning. He continued, there was, I think, six or seven states that originally ratified back in 1789. And he got all the rest of the states and ratified that amendment, the 27th Amendment. Pretty cool. But what that did was that totally rocked our world. It blew the roof off the feminists that had not given up, that said, I'm not a second-class citizen. They were like, 
what can this mean? There can be no human rights without women's rights. We gotta do something. What does this Madison Amendment mean? If we had a time limit on women's rights to get into the Constitution, how is it that this amendment that was 200 years old suddenly get ratified, didn't have to start over? This whole, this whole notion of something being timely didn't apply to the Madison Amendment, why did it apply to us? So they commissioned a legal analysis at the University of Virginia that revealed some really exciting possibilities. Women came together again, and they said, we're going to pitch in, we're going to chip in our money, and we're going to figure out how we're going to revive this ERA. Now, what was interesting was the women's movement had abandoned the ERA. They had all those issues to deal with as to why women were coming to the table in the first place asking for equality. They got really fragmented. But these few women came together, they commissioned that legal analysis, which then gave birth to the three-state strategy. See the three chickens? And the three-state strategy was based on the fact that the Madison Amendment was ratified after two centuries. So this whole notion of sufficiently contemporaneous, which means like this still reflects the will of the people after two centuries, well, we know it would because we certainly want Congress to wait for its pay raise. We don't get to award ourselves pay raises, right? They got to at least live somewhat by our rules. But so the Madison Amendment combined with the fact that ERA had been extended once before meant, ah, perhaps this means that we could actually ignore the time limit and we could keep moving on and get the last three states. So that was a really, really exciting time for women. And they tried. They tried to introduce bills. But unfortunately, they didn't have any mastermind here in the Washington, D.C. area because I was too young at the time to be in on the plan. But I'll tell you what, after I got laid off and I volunteered on Hillary's campaign that year, and I got really fed up with the sexism that she endured running for office, I don't care if you like her or not. No woman ever should be disgraced the way she was and the way that Sarah Palin was, just because they were women. So I thought, I want to work on something that is groundbreaking for our society, that brings us collectively together as human beings to do something that's right and just. And the only thing I could think of was something as fundamental as fixing the flaw, the missing piece, chunk, in our Constitution, which was women. So I started researching the ERA, and that's when I discovered it had only expired after three states. And I, I thought, wait, I mean, three more states, that's it? And I thought, okay, someone must have gone back to like tell Congress to remove the deadline. No one did. Hello. No one broke with tradition and said, how can human rights expire in a democracy? That doesn't happen. They must exist in perpetuity. A path to equality must exist in perpetuity. That became the basis of a 10-page proposal that I wrote. I do not have a background in law. I do not have a background in political science. I just have one strong belief that women and girls need to be protected in the US. Because once it happens here, it's going to be a domino effect around the world. So I drafted this proposal, and I walked down to Congress, never been in there in my life to advocate on an issue. And I ended up finding someone to introduce my bill two years later, in 2011. Then Congresswoman Tammy Baldwin from Wisconsin said, yeah, I understand sex discrimination on a lot of levels. And I understand that helping women helps me as a gay woman, and it helps other people's human rights in this country. And she introduced our bill on the 100th anniversary of International Women's Day. And the goal for us was to remind the US government that you can't curb the human rights abuses of women and girls abroad while you continue to deny us constitutional equality at home. It got 56 co-sponsors, all Democrats. That was a bit disappointing. But for a first debut, we would take that. In 2012, Senator Ben Cardin from the great state of Maryland, who had actually voted for the ERA back in 1972 as delegate Ben Cardin, said, you know what? 
Maryland, inter or, excuse me, Maryland ratified the ERA two days after Congress did, March 24, 1972. I don't believe there should have been a deadline on this. I like this bill because this bill says get rid of the deadline completely. I'll introduce this bill. So he introduced my bill on the 40th anniversary of when the ERA first passed Congress in 1972. And that, in fact, actually it passed the Senate. And some women here in the room were actually there for that celebration. And it was really, really exciting because for the first time in our country's history, since the ERA expired 30 years ago, the Senate recognized a three-state path for the ERA. A bill ever since 1982 has been introduced to start things all over again. As you can imagine, it didn't go anywhere. Why in the world would women fall for that trick again? Thank goodness they haven't, but there is that possibility. There are two bills in Congress. My plan is we work together and you guys are really technologically savvy and you have students all over the place on Facebook and social media and you could like spread the word. We call upon our members of Congress to remove the deadline and then we go after our map of those southern states and we try to pick off as many of those 15 that are remaining because I think we should have all 15, but I'll take the first three to put us in the Constitution as soon as possible. So I don't want to be working on it forever. Our foremothers have worked on it entirely too long and our forefathers that were involved and we don't need to work on this forever. So the goal is 2015. I began in 20, 2009, now 2013. So I need your help. So the plan is remove the deadline for the Equal Rights Amendment. It has not been introduced this session. Senator Cardin will be introducing it hopefully in April. And Congressman Rob Andrews from New Jersey, Dr. Alice Paul's state, will be introducing the House bill for Senator Baldwin. So once we remove this deadline, I think if we came together as a country, I think we'd have the American Spring. And we removed this deadline in the 113th Congress, and we said, we don't care if you're Democrat or Republican, we want this for the people in this country. Our society is suffering because 50% of it has been left out, women. If you look at all of the issues that we're all facing, it all has to do with compassion. What's going on for us? We don't take care of ourselves. We can't take care of each other. So many people are without jobs, without hope, without a future. Students in debt can't get jobs. What are we going to do? We need to start looking at ourselves, and we need to start finding our way back to our humanity, our common humanity. I believe that will happen when we pass this amendment. It'll be the same kind of energy shift that we felt when President Obama became president. Did you feel that shift in the energy in this country? It was almost like breathing a sigh of relief. <sighs> we have finally, finally done something that although it's not gonna wipe away racism overnight, but it's a start. We've set a benchmark now. We're not going back. We need to do that for women. So once we remove that deadline and we go after those three states, we will be building on our legacy, a legacy that began, well, you could go far back to Adam and Eve, but <laughs> Eve being responsible for the fall of Adam, if you believe that story. But we'll just start at 1776 and say that this has been a legacy of people coming together and recognizing the human rights that are sorely needed in our society. And as a woman, I don't want to watch any more shows that don't tell me that I deserve my rights too, and that my sisters don't deserve their rights. And my mother, who's 82, who told me when I was seven or eight that women would not be safe until they had the ERA. She doesn't deserve to die like so many women have died without being citizens in this country. And I think what's really cool is that sometimes young people will tell me, young people, I'm in my mid-40s, so younger than me, will say, isn't this like my mother's thing? I mean, do we really need this? Yeah, we need this. Because your rights can be taken away with a single vote 
at the whim of a legislature until it's in the Constitution, until it's written down in our federal document. And when I say, yes, you need this because you're a part of this, this isn't your mother's ERA. This is your ERA. This is our ERA. They did their part. They brought us two-thirds of Congress and 35 states. But we're not there yet. We have three states. So this is our chance. This is our opportunity to grab the torch as society and make our mark in the history of this country, this generation. So I gave you my, my, my answer already, but the 1943 plus 72 is 2015. That is the simple little mathematical equation that I came up with to say that I couldn't be a poor activist for the rest of my life. I wasn't gonna go back to corporate America. I started this in 2009. We have bills in Congress, they'll be coming again. But I said, 2015, if we don't have the ERA by then, if women don't wake up and stand up and say, you know what, we need equality in this country. We need to move this country forward. It is not on the wrong path, and it's not on the wrong path because women aren't in the passenger seat or the driver's seat. I don't care what. We don't have to rule the world, but we definitely need to be partners and co-stewards of America's future because we are going down the drain. And it is because women aren't there. It is because our voices aren't being heard, our perspectives aren't being recognized, we aren't valued, and it needs to change. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to be so heavy hitting, but it's just, <sighs> let me take a breath. When you live this, it becomes heavy hitting because you're always bumping up against a wall. Change is really tough. And it's really tough when you're bumping up against a wall from progressives and liberals. That's what's really hard when you're fighting your own team on something so important as this. But I see the ERA as our breaking with tradition. It is our butterfly effect. It is something that maybe sounds really insignificant to you in your life, but it has been being worked on for two centuries, and we are so close to getting it. So we can pretty much, as a generation here, because we've got a wonderful mix of generations here, which is the perfect complement for ERA, because there are people who remember the original ERA, and there are people who are new to it. This is about all of us coming together. It's about having responsibility for what the freedom that we have today and paying it forward to the next generation so that their lives are even better than our lives. And it goes on and on and on. So perhaps, I hope, that I've given you some sense of the incredible opportunity that we have. We have bills in Congress. So Congress is saying we will consider removing this deadline. But it's really up to us. It is up to us to call. They're human like we are and say, hey, you know what? Remove the deadline. Senator Cardin, he's my senator. I want you to co-sponsor this bill. I want you to pass this. You could even call Senator Cardin and say, hey, you know what? I just heard you are the most fabulous senator because you're taking on something that is so big and it's going to have tremendous ramifications for our country going forward. Get involved. We need to remove this deadline. And then the fun begins. Because I want to have a national competition to see which one of these wimpy states that is so fearful of the sky falling and women being equal to recognize and wake up to the benefits that will happen for our entire country when this happens. I want to pit them against one another. We can mentor them. Maryland is like, you know, you guys are off the charts. I live in DC, so we don't get a vote on constitutional amendments. But you guys have the ERA in your constitution. You ratified the federal two days after. I mean, you guys are the bomb. But it could be fun. And it could be our piece of history that if you do nothing else in your life and you're sitting in your chair at some later, later, much later date, and you're talking to your kids about one of those things that you did in your life, because it was the right thing to do, imagine being able to tell them that you put women and girls half our society in the Constitution. You are a part of that change. So the ERA 2015 campaign can be found at unitedforequality.com, info, see Cook 
at unitedforequality.com. I can give you scripts to call Congress. We can go down and lobby Congress, which is actually quite fun to meet with um, staff members. And you'll see how many young people are running Capitol Hill. And you'll go, gee, I'd like to go do that. Um, but I, I appreciate so much the opportunity to come and present the Equal Rights Amendment to you, why I believe in this so strongly, why I think that this is an opportunity for all of us to come together, to pull women, to pull women's issues, which are social issues, out of the darkness and into the light. And I have a closing little poem that I wanted to share with you, if I can get back to my notes here, which are somewhere, okay. A symbol of hope. A butterfly lights beside us like a sunbeam, and for a brief moment its glory and beauty belong to our world. But then it flies again, and though we wish it could have stayed, we're lucky to have seen it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our moment to break from patriarchal tradition that has long ignored women and girls. A tradition predicated on the belief that women were inferior and not competent to participate beyond the domestic sphere in society. The ERA targets government to level the playing field for men and women so that we are all playing by the same set of rules. ERA is not about the choices one makes, it's about the options that one has. We are the butterfly for the next generation. If our culture remains unchanged, not only will women's rights be denied for more years, but a vast and potent resource for America's economic recovery, quality of life, and future global competitiveness will be squandered. Remember the spirit that we talked about, and maybe a few of you, I think, felt when you broke free from tradition, or if you think later and something comes up where you took a brave step, remember that feeling and take action as United for Equality for the ERA. What the caterpillar perceives as the end to the butterfly is just the beginning. Thank you.